We are here with the League of Women Voters of Greater Hartford and WHCTV for the Town Council Candidate Debate. The League of Women Voters is pleased to be able to bring you this nonpartisan voter service in cooperation with West Hartford Community Television, and we thank the campaigns for their cooperation. My name is Janet Lenore, and I am a member of the League of Women Voters of Greater Hartford. I will serve as the moderator for this debate, one of two we will have with the town council candidates. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan but political organization that works to encourage informed and active participation in government. We hope this debate will serve as one piece of information you will use as you prepare to vote. This town council debate will be conducted in a modified cumulative time format. What this means is it's designed to help the candidates to freely elaborate on their approaches to a variety of issues, unimpeded by the strict time constraints of more traditional debate formats. Each candidate will have a total of nine minutes response time during the debate. When speaking, each candidate is timed by his or her own League of Women Voters timekeeper and we thank the timekeepers for coming here tonight. Periodically, the timekeepers will hold up signs indicating the amount of time remaining for each candidate. After each candidate has a chance to respond to a question, candidates are encouraged to rebut, responding to their differences as they perceive them, but understanding that the clock will be running. Each candidate has an additional two minutes for a closing statement. The order of closing was determined by lottery, as was the initial question that I will pose tonight. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce the town council candidates who have committed their time and energies to this important aspect of the democratic process, running for elective office. The first candidate is Mary M. Fay. She is a resident of West Hartford for 15 years and is a financial services senior executive. She has held several senior business leadership roles, including Senior Vice President and General Manager of Sun Life Financial, where she has also chaired diversity and inclusion employee resource groups and served on Sun Life boards. Mary has also been Senior Vice President of GE Capital and Senior Vice President of ING. Starting out as a financial analyst, Mary has also held executive positions at The Travelers, Hartford Healthcare, the Hartford and AIG. Mary was raised in East Hartford and attended public schools. She went on to graduate from Skidmore College and earned an MBA from Rensselaer Polytech Institute. Active in her community, Mary was appointed to the West Hartford Library Board and is a frequent volunteer at Morley School and is active in Save Our Water. Mary also serves on the Board of Overseers for Newton Wesley Hospital is chair of the reviewing stand for the annual St. Patrick's Day Parade and was named a top woman in business by Hartford Business Journal. Mary was an inaugural member of West Hartford's first parent leadership training institute where she was elected class speaker. She is a member of the Irish American Home Society and Thistle Lawn Bowling Club and is a parishioner of St. Timothy's. Mary is married to Mary Smith and together they have a seven-year-old daughter, Katie. Thank you, Mary, for being here tonight. Thank you. Liam Sweeney is running for town council in West Hartford. Liam is a lifelong resident of West Hartford where he attended Morley, King Philip, and Hall High School and was captain of the Hall High basketball team. Sweeney is a graduate of Temple University. After graduating from Temple, he went on to work for Senator Dodd and other various federal, state, and local elected officials and is now a principal at Penn Lincoln Strategies based here in West Hartford. He is a founding board member of Active City, a nonprofit that helps to provide affordable sports recreation options for underprivileged children in the greater Hartford area. Liam also participates in the West Hartford Public Schools mentoring program and is a parishioner at St. Patrick St. Anthony's Church. Sweeney and his wife Whitney live in the Morley School area with their son, Rory. Liam is running to ensure equity in West Hartford through smart growth and business development, strong schools, and safe and welcoming communities. 
Thank you, ma'am. Chris Williams is here to my <laughs> to my left. Chris has been an uh, has been honored to serve on his hometown's town council these past two years. He has served on the finance and budget, public safety, and served as educational liaison subcommittees. Chris grew up in town, graduated from Conard High School, and is now raising his two children, Leela and Joey, in town with his wife, Holly. He is a litigation attorney with the firm of Conway Stoughton, which is also located in town. So thank you, Chris. Thank you. Ben Wenegrad is to my right, and he is completing his first term on town council. There he serves as Chair of Community Planning and Physical Services and on Human Services. A graduate of Wesleyan University and Northeastern University School of Law, as well as Duffy, Sedgwick, and Conard, Ben works for the American Federation of Teachers as a union representative. He is a member and former executive board member of Congregation Beth Israel, where he is best known for running community coffee on Sunday mornings. Ben lives on Lily Road with his wife Shannon and his daughter Sasha. His mom Marlene lives at Chatfield. So thank you Ben for being here. Thank you. Finally, Sherry Cantor is the mayor of her hometown of West Hartford. She is a member of the Yukon Board of Trustees, her alma mater. Sherry graduated magna cum laude with a BS in accounting and is a registered CPA. She has served as town councilor since 2004, deputy mayor since 2011, and as mayor as of May 2016. As a leader in the community, Sherry is committed to leading with honesty and integrity, including and, val and valuing all voices in respectful dialogue and engaging people of all ages in shaping a caring, diverse, and dynamic community. So thank you, Sherry. Thank you. Earlier, we decided who would take the first question, and Ben, you won the draw. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll start with infrastructure. We all drive <coughs> the roads here in West Hartford. What planning should our town council be involved in or doing to address present and future infrastructure needs? I struggle with the word, right. but I know <laughs> what I'm saying. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. And for, first of all, uh, thank you, of course, to the women voters for hosting this. Uh, my mom's a a life member of the league and has served in the p role that you're doing tonight of timekeeping and moderating. So thank you all and also to, of course, uh, West Hartford uh, Community TV, a wonderful service. Um, we actually do spend a lot of time on, on roads. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we have a, a long-term plan for how often we pave, obviously. Um, I've heard a lot of complaints the last few weeks about every road's potholes, um, but you know, we do have a long-term plan, and we do do a set amount of miles per year. Um, what's really exciting about our roads is the, um, the streets initiative. Um, you know, we are, every time we do any kind of paving, any time we do any road project, um, and this was really an initiative of, of Sherry primarily, um, you know, we look to see whether or not we can improve uh, access, safety, both for bicyclists, pedestrians, and cars. So we've been adding bike lanes, we've been doing, um, safer uh, intersections. Again, every time we do it, we don't just want to repave what we've done before, but we want to look and see whether or not we can make the town more walkable, walkable more livable. Um, and I think that's really been evident in, uh, in the appearance of the town. And we're making the town into just a much more uh, fun place to live in because of the infrastructure projects we've been doing. Excellent, excellent. Thank you very much. Mary, the same question to you. What, with respect to infrastructure here in West Hartford, um, can you give us some guidance as to what you think that the town council should be planning and doing moving forward? Certainly. Along the lines of what Ben just said, I would like to thank everybody for hosting us. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'm looking forward to a lively discussion. You know, roads and infrastructure are extremely important to West Hartford, Hartford, and Connecticut, without a doubt. And uh, I think things could use some improvement. I think we've done some great jobs. It's a very walkable city, which is what I appreciate about it. Lots of sidewalks. I think there's safety when kids walk to school, so a lot of good things are happening. I've been walking door to door, and uh, a lot of the concerns that I've been hearing, and I think we need to address, is the speeding that goes on on the roads. We have a lot of main thoroughfares. I happen to live near one on North Main Street, 
and people are concerned about the speed of cars, uh, the safety of pedestrians, and of course bicyclists. I'll actually be out walking on October 4th with a community organizer who wants to do something. And I know we've talked about a road diet, but it's probably becoming more critical. Well, a road diet, can you explain what that is? Yeah, they, they, th to address the safety concerns and to make them more walkable and pedestrian friendly as well as for bicyclists, there's ways that you can design roads and do different things to make the speeders so to speak, slow down. Okay. Um, I also think we can probably do some things with redesigning some of the main arteries to alleviate some traffic, which which people are also talking about. You know, it takes a long time to get from Elmwood to the north end of town and from east to west, and uh, perhaps we can start talking about ways to improve that down the road. Going faster is not an answer. Going faster is okay. certainly not an answer. All right, wonderful. Liam, how about you? What thoughts do you have for infrastructure here in West Hartford? Uh, well, I'd also like to say thank you <laughs> the, the League for having me here. Um, but I think West Hartford has done a really good job over the long term. And if you look at uh, other municipalities across the state right now, um, West Hartford is in really good shape in regards to where we all are. And uh, I think one of the you know great things we've done is I think particularly on Farmington Avenue, you've seen you know the town make steps to slow down traffic there. Uh, by reducing the lane sizes, uh, we've done a lot of work on the sidewalks. Obviously, there's always room to you know be made in that in that place. But I think the town really has made some very very good progress in that reform. Uh, I also like Mary have been out hitting doors, uh, and there are obviously always going to be some concern areas that have speeding or potholes and that sort of thing. But I think that's just you know part of the thing of being in a in a great thriving city that has such a involved uh, electorate and community. People are going to give you feedback on the doors, and you know nothing's going to ever be happy. But I think <coughs> this, I think uh, Sherry and, and folks have done a really good job of trying to address everyone's infrastructure concerns while also trying to keep the the the, the budget balanced, and also while dealing with you know. Uh, potential lack of funding coming from outside sources as well. So I think in general we could always do a better job, um, but I think uh, right now in regards, if you look at West Harvard, it's one of the best places to live in uh, the country, as you've seen by so many different magazines and publications. But I think it's really, uh, you know, I think we're really in the right direction, but you know, I'm always open to new ideas of how to, how to make it better. Okay, excellent. How about you, Chris? Do you have any thoughts to expand upon this? Sure, Janet. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, everyone. Um, won't belabor the point, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I think that in terms of infrastructure, I think everything comes back ultimately to our budget, right? So right now we have a $285 million budget in town. Uh, we have exponential tax increases year after year. Uh, we have not fundamentally addressed, I think, a lot of the underlying collective bargaining issues that we have with our collective bargaining units. And so what you're going to see moving forward is less and less money being spent on things like infrastructures. When I go door to door, what I hear about is concerns about the roads. I hear concerns about the physical structure of the schools. Um, there haven't been repairs on the exterior, things like that in our fields. And unless we can sort of fundamentally uh, change our budgeting year to year, we're going to have less money for things like infrastructure. So when I hear the term infrastructure, that's where I go, Janet. Okay, and, I, and I'm glad you mentioned buildings too, because that's something, I mean, I started out with roads, but Sherry, can you expand a little bit Absolutely. on that? Absolutely. We've been very committed to investing in our all of our public um, buildings over time, and it's been very measured and s planned, so we don't have these uh, deteriorating uh, deferred maintenance situations and then have to have major construction. Um, we actually have done a lot of work with energy efficiency, uh, with you know dual transfers over from oil to gas and um, and many many uh, the digital monitors and lots of work has been done on that so we can save money uh, with our budget uh, we also have done a lot of work with um, trying to uh, with grants we've done a, a greenway project which is primarily paid for through grant money we actually received a, a very substantial grant I actually drove with our US senators to the interchange 84 interchange on a very very big uh, job that will be done there. So we work really hard to uh, try to maximize tax dollars, have them go in responsible ways, and work with the state and federal government to get what we can to improve our infrastructure. Well, I'd like to hear that because with the budget not being decided by the state yet and us facing perhaps lack of state funding, we definitely need to find some way to come up with some money to pay for the things we'd like to have continue and the new things that we'd like to to have in the future. Liam, would you care to comment on 
without state funding, how can our town address the budget shortfall that we're anticipating? Uh, without, without the state budget? Without the state funding, uh, correct. Well, I mean, I don't think any municipality in the entire state could deal without state dollars. I mean, right now, all municipalities de de depend heavily upon the state for that. And that's just the way that we've been structured. So the idea that our municipality is any different than anyone else at this point in this juncture is, is just something that's not a, a, f a fact out there. Every municipality in the entire state state is in the same situation that West Hartford is in. Um, obviously, you know, there are other places. I think West Hartford is actually in a better place than most municipalities when it comes to that, in the sense that, you know, you've heard from surrounding communities that their lights will turn off in the next time, and West Hartford is not in that place. And I think that goes to a credit to the folks at this table who have done such a good job uh, planning for that. I think a lot of that goes to Mayor Cantor in regards to getting ready for that, I think building for that. I think we've had a lot of community discussions on that, a lot of feedback from the community of how the town can prepare for that. I think this last budget, I think uh, the Democrats definitely worked on a, col a collaborative way to hear from folks on how the community can do a better job of spending its money, and I think they've uh, done what they, the best they can, and no one can prepare for a $25 million cut if that's what you know we're hearing out there. But um, in regards to how, the, how the, the town can go without state funding, I think you know that's that's not the way municipalities are set up in this in, in Connecticut. It depends so much on state money. So, yeah. no, it is. It's very difficult. But we are anticipating that, right, Chris? And you were going down that road when we were talking about infrastructure. Absolutely. So care to comment on the budget? Sure, absolutely. So, what happened during this last budget cycle uh, was that since really since January, Governor Malloy has been screaming at the top of his lungs that the town would not receive municipal uh, funding to the level that it had in past years. So the town council, I think, took some steps in anticipation of that, but I don't think that the majority went far enough. What they did was they assumed $7 million less than we have received in past years, and they factored that into the budget. That was based upon, at the time, representations and understanding from uh, the state delegation. They also assumed that the collective bargaining units moving forward that will be in negotiations next year would take a pay freeze without a guarantee of that. What I th said, what I thought should have happened is that it was an opportune time for the town to deal with some of the fundamental uh, structural issues we have moving forward. Everyone complains, many people complain, rightfully so, about the fact that the town budget has gone up $127 million or 80% since the Democrats have taken over. It's a huge number. At the same time, population has stayed flat. School enrollment has gone down. It was time given the fact that the governor was saying no money, there's no more. Uh, we should have sat down, I think, with our partners in our collective bargaining units and demanded that we can, for their sake as well as ours, create a relationship that was sustainable moving forward. Because what we have is not that. Okay. Um, and I think we missed that opportunity. And because of it, in that only $7 million assumption, that th there are no good choices left. Okay. That kind of leaves us between a rock and a hard place. So, Sherry, how would you respond to that? So, I, I think we actually have addressed a lot of structural issues, and this is a, a little history and a little bit in the weeds. But in the 90s, there were no payments made to the pension plan, and not only were there no payments made to the pension plan, there were no employee contributions made to the pension plan. So, when I came on board in 2004, we had made the first contribution. The plan was over 100% funded because of double-digit inflation. That was a function in the 90s. And when I came on board, there was, uh, we were making about, a, we started with about a million dollar contribution. Now we are paying 22, almost $22 million a year in that pension contribution. Most of that is for old uh, it's for employees that have already earned their time, and those, uh, and there's nothing we can do about that particular um, situation without meeting that debt obligation and that liability. But what we have done is we've negotiated since 2006, eliminating overtime in our pension contribution, eliminating. Um, uh, uh, moving most of our employees to a hybrid plan, which is largely defined contribution, a very small defined benefit um, piece to it, so our defined benefit plan would also be healthy because we needed money coming in. In the meantime, we also reduced our headcount, so we had less people paying into the plan, which also made that situation worse. So there are major structural issues that have projected us in a way where we have had to build up being a AAA bond rated community, being responsible for past mistakes, where we've had to commit 
to doing that, that th with that um, kind of discipline, and we have committed to that while we've negotiated and decreased liabilities down the road. So um, we're 128th out of 169 towns in per people spending. We have combined every job in school and board, um, school and town administration, one of the few communities in the state to do that. We've remained a AAA bond rated community during very tumultuous times. So I think that we have been extremely responsible and, and uh, we are prepared to deal f with uh, a severe um, cut from the, from the state. Uh, seven million, we cut five million dollars from our proposed budget. We took a seven million dollar contingency. We also have some other money set aside from surplus. So we're prepared. We don't think that our community that has been run so efficiently and effectively should be punished for the way we have uh, done such a good job. Uh, we have the highest reserve levels we have ever had. Uh, so we're in a good place to weather some change. I'm not promoting that you cut us <laughs> <laughs> to that extent um, because I think we've done things right and we should be used as an example. I, I think everybody would agree we don't want to punish our town, right. but we are trying to anticipate what the state might do. So what thoughts do you have to share, Mary? Yeah, thank you. Well, I, I think a couple. I think we've known what's happening with the state and Hartford as well, and I think it pains everybody. Nobody wants to see our state in distress or, or Hartford on the brink of insolvency. But they all kind of have common elements, and it's all this gigantic pension liabilities that are on the books of all, you know, the state, Hartford, and quite frankly, West Hartford. So, so I applaud some of the progress that's been made, but this is kind of my expertise. I've run pension businesses and retirement uh, businesses and healthcare businesses and even though we've made some progress we did go from 110 percent funded um, and i think it was 2002 and now we're down to 42 percent funded and we're making basically the minimum payments which are about 20 million dollars so we've somehow got to figure out a way to crack that nut whether it's some actuarial assumptions need to be revised or our discount rate or whatnot but that needs to be an area of focus because we've seen this movie right we've seen the state fall into this and get distressed and we've seen Hartford fall into this. So that, that's a number one thing because like everybody else, we love West Hartford and we wanna put the money into infrastructure, we wanna put the money into schools, the things that we're known for, the things that make us a number one community. Having it go into these liabilities is really a drain on us and we've gotta figure out a way to get there. The second thing I would say is, I know the state budget, it's very difficult, but we've gotta find a way to come together. There was a proposal on the table where West Hartford could get their funding back. And I wish that our leaders who represent us in West Hartford fought harder for that. I think it's hard for us. We're, 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 we want to be town officials, or I'm aspiring to that. The rest of you are town officials, with the exception of Liam. We can only do so much. We, we're, we're trying to manage the town and advocate for the town, but we have to rely on the people who are at the state level to help us. And I, I see that as a bit of a disconnect, and it would have been nice if we had uh, you know, gotten better at that big $23 million gap. Okay. Wonderful, thank you. Ben, we haven't heard from you on this issue. No, I get to follow up some great answers. Uh, let me start off by just saying, um, I work um, around the state. I'm familiar with many towns um, over the years that, um, that I've worked with. And I, I just got elected, so I assumed that West Hartford was a well-run place. That was our reputation. Um, it wasn't until I actually started serving um, that I could see in how incredibly well-run we are. Um, I've seen you know, mismanagement of various sorts all over the state. Um, we don't have it here. Uh, this is, uh, and certainly anytime recently, the most well-run town, and it shows. Um, there's a reason why uh, we have both an incredible quality of life and AAA ratings from the, all the bond agencies. We're unique among that. Other towns that have AAA ratings are in Fairfield County or towns that have far less economic diversity than we do. We're doing something right. And when you talk about the pension, yes, it was very low funded. Um, there were people who came into office and promised that there would be zero taxes. And well, how do you get zero taxes? You take it away from the pension. It's a really easy solution, and it works, and it's very good politically in the short term. But what it left us was a hole that uh, the Democrats have been working for years to fix. And the proof of the uh, efficiency of that plan is that we're still AAA rated despite having a really low funded pension. I mean, 40% is, you know, 43, whatever we are, and that was lousy. Except that they've seen our plan and they're confident in our ability uh, to get it done. Um, so I think that's something we should need to be proud of. And, um, and again, it's really proof of what we're doing right. Um, one other comment in terms of 
in the efforts being made to uh, fight back against the budget. Yes, we all know um, that Malora's original budget had a huge cut for West Hartford as well as other towns. Um, you'll note that when his revised one, even from the governor, uh, reduced that cut significantly. Um, the, uh, the two failed plans in the legislature uh, each did us far better. <coughs> That's a result of exactly the kind of work that was done primarily by our mayor. Um, we were up at the Capitol fighting for West Hartford, um, and we had an impact. Um, and as a result of that, nobody's talking in terms of the budgets that are out there. No one's talking about the kind of draconian cuts we were originally being faced with. So I think we've done our job. We've put ourselves in a much better position to handle um, the state cuts. And when they come, um, we've got, as well as possible, as Liam said, you know, a $24 million cut is impossible to deal with. Um, and how do you plan for something that horrible? But what we are more likely to face is something that I think we can do. Um, and if it is a bigger cut than we expect, we'll do what we've done in the past, which is pay our bills, be responsible, um, and put ourselves in the best position possible for the future. Okay, well, it sounds like on both sides of the fence, we're trying to plan ahead, and that's a good sign. Um, Janet, can I just make yeah, one, absolutely, one final comment please. on that? <clears throat> I think the issue is whether or not we have cuts this year and how much from the state. The point is, the state is out of money. And so next year, and the year after that, and the year after that, West Hartford is not getting money to the levels that it has, to the levels that its current agreements are predicated upon. So we have to fundamentally change how we operate because un unless we do, every year we're gonna look at shortfalls of $20 million or so. And in terms of the AAA bond rating, it's a wonderful thing, it's a great thing. But you know, our mill rate is 41.04. That puts us in league with Norwich, New London, New Haven. Think about the economic vibrancies of those towns, whether West Hartford wants to share it. Um, if certain things go wrong with the state funding, uh, our rainy day fund is essentially going to have to be rated, and there goes the AAA bond rating. So it's good we have it, but it's hanging in the crosshairs right now, and depending upon the way th what the state does, it may be gone. And that's going to be the case year after year after year until we fundamentally change how we operate. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Care to rebut? Well, I, 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 I will. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I think um, we constantly change the way we structure. We have done smart growth planning and creative development planning um, to bring in revenue to fund our, our schools and our, our public safety. We are, again, 100, when I went to school in Hall, mm -hmm. at Hall High School a long time ago, I won't tell you what year I graduated, we were number one in per-pupil spending. We have 70 languages spoken in our, um, in our schools. Uh, we have 22% um, uh, uh, free and reduced lunch. We have a uh, 42 percent minority uh, population in our schools. It's a much different school population than I ever uh, than when, when I went to school. We're 120 out of 169 because we've changed the structure. We continually change the structure in how we deliver public works, public safety, uh, the way we uh, actually improve our infrastructure. We have streamlined with other utilities to do things so much more efficiently. Um, we actually, we spent, uh, our debt has decreased by 10% over the last 10 years. Our, um, and, and our employee uh, headcount has decreased 10% over 20 years. We have changed. We will continue to change. You can't do it in a year. It is like ch turning a barge. When those pension agreements were made, nobody thought people were lived to 80, 90 years old, and then the lack of funding was critical um, to, the, to the structure. But we are determined not to destroy the community while we make these structural changes. Good. I, I, I love to hear about the cooperation you were talking about because it kind of leads me into the next question. And Mary, this is, are there opportunities for us to work with other towns? Um, we mentioned Hartford, we mentioned East, uh, we mentioned a lot of towns. Ben mentioned that he travels around and we compare favorably to other towns. But what can we do to work with other towns and perhaps streamline um, if possible? So I think what you're getting at is regionalization or, or county government. And I guess a couple observations. Um, I've lived in county where it's worked and what I've seen that was in Virginia, and what I've observed is that it works really, really well where there's widespread population. So there's lots of people in rural areas and you kind of pull them together so they don't have to have a superintendent and police force in every single solitary little town which might have two or 3,000 people. That, it can work there, but even when they did that in Virginia, they left the major metropolis, metropolitan areas like Richmond, 
or Alexandria or the DC metro area as standalone cities running because the needs are so different between those populations and the things that you have to cover. So it pains us to see Hartford in the situation that it is. I think all of us want to see Hartford succeed, but I'm not sure the way we're structured and our denseness of population, 3.7 million people in such a small area, that you can completely move to regionalization. I think if we designed Connecticut today with a white sheet of paper and we weren't built the way we were, maybe. But I'm not sure that works. But if you're asking about trying to help Hartford, we are. 50% of their revenues come from Connecticut, which, guess what, it's all of us as taxpayers. So I think we all are trying to fund Hartford to succeed. Regionalization, it depends on how you describe it. Does it mean that you combine Hartford, West Hartford, East Hartford, Bloomfield, the greater metro area, and you've got kids going to schools all over the place? I think that's going to be problematic because you're taking your child out of their neighborhood and you know it's a long day for them. So there probably are some opportunities that we could perhaps identify, whether it's some backroom things like payroll or maybe sharing some library systems or like that. But I think it would be very hard with a densely populated area, um, with the financial situation and distress of Hartford, we can't keep pouring money into Hartford and thinking things are going to change without some system systemic changes to the way the city is run and the way their financials are structured. Okay, appreciate that. Uh, ben, Liam, care to comment? Well, I mean, I think the, the Greater Hartford area already does some, some of these collaborations. I think you, you, you I mean, I think to uh, what Mary was saying uh, about the schools, we already do that. We, you know, we have the chef, chef ruling, so we already have regionalization in regards to our schools in the sense that we have kids going from West Hartford to Hartford and vice versa, and from Simsbury to West Hartford, we have kids coming into our town, which we do a great job. We educate kids from outside of the school district. I think uh, we also um, are uh, part of a regional system that t deals with the public health uh, as well. Um, so I think th there's already stuff that's out there. I think the the state, I think to Mary's point, is that the um, <laughs> we have 169 different little towns, and you know, and I think that you know, if, if we did this all over again, I think we'd probably rethink that idea. <laughs> um, but I think West Hartford, you know, w works pretty well, and we are such a large community. We, we're called we're called a town, but we're we're, we're we're so big, right? No, we've grown to, you know, to a very large area. Some people would consider it a city at this point. And we're, we're providing, and I think Sherry talked about this, you know, our school system has completely changed. We're providing new services all the time, I think. But I think one of the main things that West Hartford does such a really good job, particularly in education, is it's, it's special ed. Uh, people move here for special education. Um, as someone who worked in leisure services here, we provide a service to the Greater Hartford area. I, I know families that moved here to, to live in this town, whether they were you know, just moving here for K through 12, but they moved here for those those services that we provided them, and we continue to do so. And I think it's been really great that this this body has worked really well to ensure that those services are, which are so important. I mean, I, I know everyone here uh, has someone that's close to them has a, a, a child with special needs. There's so much that those parents go through, and th this town does such a great job doing that. I think. That's one thing that I think we, we serve the region in that. And so people come here for those services. And I think, you know, we continue to put the emphasis forward. I think Ben touched about this. It's like, we are a community that cares about people, and we will always put people first. And I think that's a major thing that we do a really good job about. Ben, how about you? I, Any opportunities you see? So I think that um, we always have to be creative and, mm -hmm. and look for those opportunities. When we're elected to represent West Hartford, we need to do what's in the best interest of West Hartford. But we should always be looking to see, in a particular idea, is there a way to work with other towns or cities to figure out a better way to do it to save some money? Um, so for example, I'll give an example that, that didn't work, but we looked at it, which was <coughs> under um, state rules, we had to hire, we had to do better uh, street sweeping, called MS4, which is really getting in the weeds. But basically, we had to do a better job um, for environmental purposes of sweeping the roads and of cleaning um, the drains. And we had to purchase pretty expensive equipment for it. So when that came up um, in my committee, my first question was, you know, can we share the, the, that, those machines with other towns? Mm -hmm. Now, it turned out that the amount of work we were going to have to do would mean that we were going to be using those trucks pretty much constantly. They're always being used. There is no opportunity in that instance to share it. But that's the kind of thing we have to think about. If we have equipment that other places you know, could use, 
we rent it out, whatever else, and we buy, or we buy it together. And I, I do think you know, we should always be looking for those opportunities. I think the town is. Um, I think um, our new town manager that we all uh, worked to, to get hired, and we, we think did a great job of hiring him, um, that he's also looking for those kind of efficiencies. Um, of course, we want to work with other towns, um, again, to, to serve all our residents better. And we have to we keep our eyes open. Excellent, excellent. Sherry, any last comments? Uh, we do have a regional uh, water um, board that uh, a Metropolitan Commission, commission that's set up like a, a, a municipality. Um, and again, I, when regional is when you are in a region, and I think we have to view ourselves as a region of Hartford. We all have strengths and weaknesses um, that we can build on. We all have to be very, very careful that we have the um, the leverage and the uh, voice at the table when we're in a regional body because um, we, it can hurt our residents if we don't. Great. I'm glad we're taking those opportunities. That's wonderful. Great. Um, speaking of opportunities, are there any opportunities to bring millennials into our town, uh, new corporate tax base maybe, something like that? What kind of opportunities can we bring into our town? I would love to talk about that because <laughs> this has really been a focus of mine. Okay. So I have four all right. sons, um, all millennials. And uh, my oldest son actually is newly married uh, and lives at married two months and lives in town. And um, you are a millennial, so are you a millennial? I don't even know. But anyway, I think so. Um, so millennials are the largest generation in U.S. history. And I always thought it was the baby boom, but it's not. It's millennials, they're 90 million. Um, and they are into shared, the shared economy, and they are more transient than ever. They stay in, uh, they've been delayed in buying homes. West Hartford actually is positioned very, very well. They love vibrancy, as disconnected as they are on their devices. They love to be together and, and um, be able to participate socially. Um, they love walking, to, and they're very, very physically fit. I mean, I've done, Morgan, actually, Morgan Stanley did this very, very detailed study, and I've, I've done a lot of reading on it. And we are actually very aligned. Our transportation-oriented development is also very um, geared towards millennial living. We've added uh, hundreds of apartments online, um, w having urban centers, and not just West Harvard Center, but Park Road. Um, you know, New Britain Avenue, Bishop's Corner, having those centers that people uh, live around are all wonderful things. Uh, we're doing some work to parks to also make them uh, a little bit more friendly and contemporary. Uh, we zone for, in our industrial zone, not only for transport apartments, but also for, um, for brewery. So mm -hmm. anyway, I'm, I'm using up my time, but we're, <laughs> we're positioned very, very well to attract, and we are. And it's time to be used yes. to answer the questions. Some thoughts on this. Chris. Sure, Janet, thanks. Um, <clears throat> what I would say is I think as a millennial, I'm not sure, <laughs> uh, I think everything the mayor said is, is, is spot on in terms of overall what attracts uh, millennials, but I do think fundamentally the most important issue would be affordability, especially for that millennial who is looking to settle down. And I do know for a fact that West Hartford and its tax uh, property taxes and the rate at which they're going up uh, makes it difficult for young people to put, purchase that first home in our town. And so uh, while what the mayor says is, is accurate about uh, pedestrian friendly and people wanting more of an urban suburban mix, if not more urban, and West Hartford certainly has that. And we're also at the mercy of the state. I mean, the state is throwing every job that it can possibly out of the state. I mean, that's, that's not West Hartford's fault. But in terms of West Hartford specifically, um, the more affordable we make it, the more likely we are to have families stay here, young people invest here, which is good because we want our schools filled, we want people to, to raise their family. Um, so, you know, my family, I grew up in town, you know, Liam grew up in town, we used to play basketball together, and we stayed here, probably because we loved the town. And there would be more of us if West Hartford was not as expensive as it is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mary, any thoughts on maybe corporate redevelopment that we could bring in or? Yeah, a, a couple comments. First of all, millennials are awesome. I have a lot of nephews and nieces who are millennials. They're very creative. They have different approaches to how they do things. Um, we need to have them. They're our future. Baby boomers like me, we're aging out of the workforce and uh, seniors, we, we know that they're not really contributing ongoing to the economy because they're no longer working. No, no fault of theirs, but they're retired. So we have to go after the millennial market. We need to keep them not only in West Hartford, but in our state. And we need to be a draw to, to attract them for our workforce. You know, jobs are really a major concern. We've had a lot of corporate headquarters. GE, my former employer, is no longer in Stanford. They left the state, gone to Boston. 
you know, Aetna, that's a heartbreaker. Uh, someone here for a couple of centuries and, and now and they're <coughs> moving their headquarters. So we've got to find a way to, to incent these firms, both to stay and, and to come in and find, you know, Connecticut attractive again. But that's not going to happen, quite frankly, until we get our finances in order. People want to see, especially business leaders, stability. They want to know that uh, they can rely on budgets and things like that. The fact that we don't even have one now, it, it's really concerning. So I'm, I'm actually concerned about the opposite happening. Um, but I think, you know, West Hartford is, is fantastic. I mean, that's why I'm running. I love the town so much. I'm glad to be a resident. It's been great for my family. And there's a lot of really positive things here, undoubtedly. But Chris touched on something with affordability. Uh, you know, the expenses base is going up. It's gone up 45% in 10 years and taxes along with it. I know some folks got their escrow statements and taxes are up. And I'm not using this as a scare tactic. There's plenty of people in town who can afford this and it's not an issue. But I am concerned about seniors, young people, young families in the middle class. Uh, I hear it, you know, I, I know seniors that are not living in town any longer because they couldn't, they couldn't afford to stay. Not because they wanted to leave, but they didn't feel that they had the wherewithal to, to be able to stay. So, you know, I'd like to see that kind of stabilize over time. And, I get, and there's an adage, you get what you pay for. Mm -hmm. We have fantastic things here. So, you know, it's kind of a catch-22, but we are kind of pushing the envelope. We pride ourselves in our school systems and our communities, and they are fantastic. I love Morley School, where my daughter goes. It's great. Um, but, you know, the reality is a young woman talked to me on the campaign trail, and she, she said she needs a bigger house. She's got three young children, and there's competition. She can go to Farmington, South Windsor, Glastonbury. I'm not saying they're as good as West Hartford. I think West Hartford beats them all hands down. But there is competition when it comes to affordability and, and they still have good school system, system. So we have to kind of open our eyes a bit that we do have, they're even recreating centers in these towns. They're duplicating what we're doing. I mean, it's, flattery is a great uh, uh, you know, thing, but I, I think we need to keep our eyes open if we really want to attract millennials and, and businesses that there's other locations for them to go. Okay. Yeah, we've talked a lot about the bringing millennials in. What about corporate and business? Well, Do so you I, think there's some opportunities here? Well, I think it, it, to some extent, it, it's the same question. Mm -hmm. um, you know, GE, for example, I mean, it wasn't about taxes, obviously. They went to Boston. Um, uh, and it's going to New York. Um, it was the excitement of the, where they wanted to have their corporate headquarters. And, and frankly, primarily, the, the top people. Um, and so certainly with that, now we hope they'll leave most of their workers here. Because so I think actually their workers would prefer to be in, be in Hartford, much more affordable, uh, livable place, our region, than than Manhattan. But no, I think that we in West Hartford, and we sort of think about ourselves as a town, but we're the driver of economic development in the Hartford region. This is the place people want to live. And so the, the more we can make West Hartford an attractive place, the better we are for the whole region to attract jobs. Uh, when I was uh, door knocking this past weekend, and I kept on hit, uh, knocking on doors of, of millennials, or even younger, I thought. Uh, I, I was feeling very old as the doors were being opened by people owning homes a lot earlier than I did. But they um, were, I had like three or four people who had grown up, I was asked, where are you from, to, to see, you know, we had New Yorkers coming here from D.C. I got a bunch of people who had grown up in other towns in Connecticut. And they stayed. But they stayed in Connecticut, but they came here. And there's a reason for that, because of what we're doing right. So we're an exciting town. We're vibrant. We're the place I think young people want to live. And of course, we have to deal with the affordability. We've got to maintain uh, plentiful housing options, um, whether it's small, smaller homes, starter homes, and apartments. I think we're doing that. But it's a constant struggle of trans having better transportation needs, um, having all those sort of things that attract people. But we also want to be fun. We're working on new zoning rules to allow you know, more fun, um, what's the term, the interactive uh, uh, recreational facilities. Uh, we're doing that sort of thing um, as a job creator. And just one other point, I think that it's not just attracting millennials, I think it's also keeping um, the older people here as well. I think our seniors want to be in that kind of community as well. Um, and I think that's really why we're succeeding. Okay. Liam, yeah, how I'm, about you? As a fellow millennial <laughs> with Chris, <laughs> um, you know, there, there are a lot of reasons why I moved back here. I mean, the number one reason why millennials are moving here uh, with, with the anticipation of raising a family is the school system, which continues to be and uh, will, as long as you know, we're all here, be one of the best in the entire state and in the country. 
And I think the, this, this council has made that, uh, of both sides of the aisle, I think, has made that a number one priority. And it will always be, a, it's a n number one issue for me. Um, and, and also as a Morley School graduate, Mary, um, <laughs> you know, it, it's just, it's, it's definitely something that people want to be there. I mean, in, in my neighborhood, in the Morley School neighborhood, we can all walk there. It's very, you know, you, you have the interaction with your neighbor, but that, that's what people are looking for. But I think what, what the town has done a really great job, and we have a perfect example of this with a brand new opening of the Del Mar. I mean, things of that nature that are bringing kids in. I mean, you have right across the street, you have the Blue, Blue Back Square, we have all restaurants and, um, and bars opening up, with, you know, this is the, as Ben was saying, this is the hub of Greater Harvard. I mean, you know, say what you want about Hartford, it, it's a great city, but West Hartford is where people of my generation uh, come, and they come and they bring their family, they spend their money, they have a great time, and that's why they want to be here. Uh, I mean, I think <coughs> the other thing that millennials want is they want great leisure services for their kids, right? Because not only, what, what's so different about our generation is that both of us, both, both people in the household are working. Right, so that we need to have really good programs for both for our kids, and we have great programs. Both uh, Chris and I—that's uh, where Chris and I first met, on, like Harry's Pizza uh, basketball. Um, but th those are th those are the type of things that we, but we have. for and, Harry's and, Pizza, okay. And, 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 but, but that's why people move here, and that's what they, they remember that that's what we come back here. We do that for. Um, I think it's just really important that we talk about how great this town is. I mean, and not only that, but how about, you know, uh, New Park Brewery, or right on New, that area is fantastic. I mean, that's, that's, you know, like, that's what cities are doing. And we're a suburban town turning a, an industrial area into a, you know, a thriving place where we have food trucks and beer and, and people are having a good time. I think that's great. And that's really, we're, we're taking it a step further. We're, and, it, and in a way we're interacting with the city at the same time. I think it's great. I, you know, I totally understand what Chris is talking about in regards to affordability. That is a number one thing, but it's also that is also a number one priority for us as well. Uh, we we have to pay the taxes too as a young family. Uh, we're very much focused on that. I think it's at the top of our mind. Um, but I told bring it back to people want to be here for the school systems, which continue to be one of the best in the country and in the state. Obviously, uh, we have a fantastic downtown. We are continuously you know rated as one of the best places to live in the, in America uh, and we're doing this all despite what's going on at the state so I think that's one of the, the best things to talk about okay. regards to Millennials and and I think both everybody has brought up affordability here in town um, we've had our mill rate increase we've had reevaluation taxes are going up what do we do mm -hmm. any thoughts can I just, the property tax uh, 10 years ago was 67% of the of this town budget. It, that We had other revenue sources. Um, the, that's no longer the case. The state actually took money from fees and other things that we did. So now it's 87% of our budget. And the, so the structure is, is difficult. We also have, are unique in West Hartford, unique to any other community around us, even unique to Hartford, in that we have two mills that are related to a sewer that nobody else has in their in their property tax structure. So um, we actually are uh, 37th in mill rate um, in comparison um, with equalized mill rate um, and uh, in com in our community. Um, so it's uh, it's a little bit um, there, it's more complicated than we think. But this is a struggle. Property tax structure was never meant to support um, the kind of of, the, of of a cost that it carries right now. Okay. So what steps can we take? Well, it obviously is. <laughs> no, that, that is. <laughs> I think one is. of the things that is, is, is already going on is we, we believe in a constant open community, you know, back and forth. And I think we will continue to do that as a number one thing that I've talked about in, in, in my campaign. I want to make sure that we have an open uh, and transparent government but also making making sure that we're upholding our end of the bargain at the same time. And it's a give and take. And you know what? From those conversations, we'll, we'll probably get better ideas than the ones that we have. Because th that's where the good ideas come from, not from the people that are sitting behind it, but from the, the, the community. They can t take, that's what we're asking at the door. When I was going the door to door and I get that question, taxes are too high. So my retort is, well, I totally understand that and I get it. So then can you talk to me about what, what we can do? And, and, and that's, that's a good give and take with folks, and yeah. they appreciate that. And, and we are looking for good ideas. So what, what can we do? What, what can we bring to the town? More business, more corporate structure? What can we bring? Are you asking me? Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. I'm looking okay. right at you. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. No, that's fine. Um, 
So f from my perspective, uh, I was disappointed during the last budget cycle that um, both the Board of Ed and the Town Council were given a menu of potential items that they could use and eliminate, programs they could eliminate to close the gap on the budget side. And what that did, what the effect of that was, was there were different uh, constituency groups in the town, be, be those who were opposed to closing a senior center or those who were opposed to eliminating Quest, battling each other. And they became, um, you know, emails after emails. And what it became was a conversation about how to protect the budget rather than how to mitigate or, excuse me, cut it down. And so I, I think that too often the focus is on programs. What are we going to cut? What will we eliminate? What I really think we need to do is change the way we operate. And what do I mean? On the collective bargaining side, yes, we are bound by binding arbitration. And it's a very perverse uh, game for the town to be involved in because what it is is each side creates their best option that they could possibly conceivably do economically. And then the arbitrator will pick one of those two options. It's not good for the town. Um, it's not about what can they do and be economically vibrant or what's fair. That's not the question. So I'm hoping that the state's going to change that rule. But if it, and by the way, that's in the bipartisan budget that, that passed the legislature. But putting that aside, it's time for us to now talk to these collective bargaining units and make them our partners. Because whatever you hear up here, the fact is, if we don't change the way that we compensate our employees and they deserve stability, there's going to be eliminations. It's just the math behind it. I mean, if we don't change our budget and we have a rule for budget, next budget cycle we're looking at mills of probably 44, 45, easily on the property side. Um, and I think the, they, these folks would probably agree with that. Uh, but the other thing is, we are, in some areas, administrative heavy. And so we can look at that as well. But I think fundamentally the issue is looking how, at how we operate it and make sure it's sustainable, not only for us in the government, not only for the population or residents who pay the taxes, but for employees because they deserve stability. They deserve to know in five years they're going to have a job, in ten years they're going to have a job, so they can prepare. They deserve that. And I think that if, particularly with what's going on in the state, we have an opportune time to finally sit down and hash that out, all of us, because the road we're on is not going to work for the taxpayers. It's not going to work for the employees. Um, so that's where I think the change has to happen. Okay. Mary, any thoughts on that? Well, that, that's a big one. I think that's a big piece of the pie. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would love to, to see growth, and I think it's challenging in a town like West Hartford because we are very developed. So there's not a lot of opportunity to either bring in you know, a new plants or even a new neighborhood. We're, we're pretty much at the tipping point. So I think we have, to, we have to think smarter. A big part of the economy right now is service and technology. I think we have to find a way to, to bring that here. Um, we've got the, the bio things going on at UConn. How can we kind of have West Hartford be a microcosm of that and do some things like that? So I think we need to focus on growth. We need to get more jobs. And hopefully that will help us stabilize as well. But I think Chris's point about collective bargaining is, is very, very big. Okay. Appreciate that, yeah. Any last comments? Um, sure. Uh, I think that we, obviously we need to grow our grand list. Um, if the more growth we can do, the better we can control uh, the taxes. Mm -hmm. uh, second, we should continue our efforts with the MDC uh, to get rid of the ad valorem tax. Um, it is an unfair that, burden. That is the two Which that The you property were, tax, yes. right. Mm -hmm. We actually pay, you know, in your property tax, you're paying for your sewage. Uh, we should get rid of that and we should um, thus reduce taxes and make it more of a user fee based system. Um, sec and then our comparison would be better up to other towns who don't mm -hmm. have that burden. And thirdly, we need to continue to work with our employees who have, in fact, uh, worked very well with administration. Um, we have cut back on pensions. We have cut back on health insurance. They have been partners with us. Um, and the way to deal with the, the unions is, in fact, to treat them as partners. OK, wonderful. I appreciate that. Liam, any last thoughts? I, th I think I, I think he oh. answered. I think I had, okay. do I have a minute? 
30, 30 seconds, 30 seconds. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Okay, right, right. Oh, I just want to say I work very, very closely with the Chamber. We actually have been so focused on um, business and welcoming uh, new businesses, and um, we actually had two businesses in the fastest growing businesses in Connecticut in West Hartford. Um, I'm meeting with them. We're talking about what do they like, what will make that better, and, uh, and continue to, to build on that excitement um, and being West Hartford. We're seeing new businesses open all the time. They're small, but they're wonderful. So. Mm -hmm. anyway. And on an upvote, for yes, sure. Absolutely. Okay, wonderful. Liam, any last thoughts on that one? Uh, no, I think the uh, <laughs> Okay, <overall>. okay. <laughs> um, I know we spent a lot of time on budget. Uh, it, money is important to people, and certainly taxes, you've heard that knocking on, mm -hmm. on the doors, for sure. Um, one last question. Uh, you know, we're all civil, having a conversation here. How do we encourage civility to continue in our town and our public schools? Anybody have time? <laughs> I'm not sure if we have any time. I think we do have a little bit of time for everybody to speak on civility. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. I don't hear. I don't see anybody cutting me off yet. So I'm. I, I think. I think as a, uh, we have to be examples as elected leaders of our local um, our local body of treating people with respect and I think we've done a great job with that I work very very closely with Denise Hall we when I became mayor we agreed that we would be an example I also think being talking to the schools uh, we go in and we frequently talk to the schools about their responsibility and how um, okay. it's civility is essential wonderful Ben um, Yes, of course. I mean, I think, and we do try really hard. Oh. Um, I think that we've had very respectful uh, relationship uh, with our Republican colleagues over the past two years. I hope we'll continue with that. Wonderful. That is great. Mary, any thoughts on that? Open-minded and consider each other's thoughts. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Respect. Chris? I think we just have to be uh, subject matter based. We do disagree often, um, but I think overall we're, we're very co collegial with each other. Passions can uh, rise because people care legitimately, but I don't think anyone ever questions the motive uh, of the other person, and so I think uh, that leads to productive discussions. That's like, it's nice to hear that the motive is always making our town better. Yeah, I mean, I think that the, town, I think that the main thing that we all have to keep in mind is equity, and then keep making sure that we continue to move forward as a town to keeping, keeping that in mind, whether it's in the school system, whether it's uh, in, you know, development, just making sure that we have an equitable process for all the folks in town, keeping in mind people's needs and, uh, you know, other people's strengths. So. That's wonderful. Well, this ends our debate. We now are going to have some closing statements from each of our candidates. We have two minutes allocated for each of the candidates to make a final closing statement. And by draw of lottery earlier, Mary, you get to go first. Very good. Uh, let me ask you a couple of questions before I start. Are you happy with the direction of our state, Hartford, and our town? Do you want to leave our town better for our children? And do you like the color purple? I love West Hartford as parks, excellent schools, and neighborhoods. What is especially wonderful is our residents and businesses and all the diversity and richness they bring. We consistently step up like Morley School where my daughter attends and holds an annual backpack brigade and red wagon food drive. West Hartford is a wonderful place to live and work, but we do face challenges. Our state and Hartford are in dire financial condition. We don't have a state budget, and West Hartford faces major cuts. West Hartford has seen expenses rise, steep property tax increases, and decreased services. We need to reverse this trend. Now for the color purple. I'm a moderate like many of you. I feel left behind by the political process and divisiveness. I hold many diverse social values. I'm a fiscal conservative believing in personal responsibility. I chose the color purple for my campaign, a combination of blue and red. We need to go beyond party lines to get things done. Cost of living and high taxes <coughs> dominate conversations, followed by jobs, good education, and safety. I will focus on these issues. I have volunteered in town and in our schools. When the MDC granted Niagara Bottling access to our water, I spoke out against the MDC's lack of transparency and oversight. What's needed now is strong financial acumen, leadership skills, problem-solving abilities, and compassion. It pains me to see the condition our state, Hartford, and towns are in. It hurts to see Connecticut and Hartford at the bottom of rankings. The policies of tax and spend have failed. I, concern, I am concerned about affordability and its impact on seniors, young people, and small business owners. This is why I'm running. My financial acumen, experience, and leadership skills are needed. I want West Hartford to continue to have greatness and vibrancy. The best schools, public safety, and fiscally sound with the opportunities for everyone. I'm asking for your vote. 
Please join me in clearing the path to keep West Hartford strong. Thank you, Mary. Liam, you are next. Absolutely. Um, thank you very much uh, for the League of Women Voters for having me again, uh, and thank you to the West Harvard Public uh, TV for, for hosting this event. Um, I am honored to be a candidate for the Democratic Party uh, this year for town council. It has been a pleasure to, to be here today with everyone. Um, but it's also just been a pleasure to go out and meet everyone at the door to door in the town that I grew up in. Um, it, it's been such an honor to talk to folks, see how hard they're working, and talk about the issues with them back and forth. But I think you know the, the, the main thing for, for me in this campaign is, is making sure that there's a back and forth between a civil, as you talked about, a civil conversation between government and the people that elect them. With all that's going on in the world right now, I think, as you talked about, civility is so important. But on top of that, I think one of the main things that I've learned in my, in my experiences is that not only that, that, that does government need to be civil, but it needs to be equitable. And I think that, this, that the town has moved in that direction. I think we need to continue to do that, whether it's through our schools, through our leisure services, uh, through our, uh, you know, our policing, our firefighters. I think we need to keep that in mind. But uh, I'll, I'll leave you at this. I, you know, I hope everyone goes out and votes, regardless of what party it is. But I, I would encourage you to vote for uh, Row A and the Democratic Party. And I appreciate uh, the support of uh, everyone out there and uh, to, the, to the league for having me today. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Sherry? Oh, thank you so much to the League of Women Voters and all the volunteers and your, your goal to bring uh, educate um, voters. Uh, and thank you so much to WACTV. Without you, we would have a much less enlightened public, and you're critical to, to that. And thank you uh, to our viewers that are watching to educate yourselves. This is really important. West Hartford is a diverse and vibrant community. We were named by Money Magazine as 15th best place to live in the small city category. Uh, this is remarkable. We were at a pool of um, 16,000 and a, a smaller pool of 823. It's impressive, but I don't want anyone to think this is by chance. West Hartford was ranked 30th out of 22,000 cities as the best place to live by livability.com just a few months ago for communities with populations between 20,000 and 350,000, the only Connecticut community ranked in the top 100. We were ranked by SafeWise as the 30th safest city in which to raise a child in the United States. Our schools continually rank as some of the best in the country by U.S. News and World Report, um, 70 different languages spoken and 128 out of 169 in spending. We've remained a AAA bond rated community. Uh, we have millions of dollars in investment and reinvestment. Home values have remained strong. And this success doesn't happen by chance. These are significant accomplishments because of strong leadership and good governance. Um, we have been always thinking and leading for the future to ensure stability, responsibility, integrity, civility, and compassion. Uh, I've always worked tirelessly on behalf of our community with all constituencies. I fight for West Hartford at the state level and work with our employees to achieve common goals. Leadership and hard work, integrity, dignity, respect, compassion, and empathy are more critical than ever. I have been so honored to serve you, and I am grateful for your trust. I will continue to do all I can to serve the wonderful community of West Hartford. Please support me and the Democratic team on uh, November 7th. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sherry. Ben? Thank you. Uh, let me begin by just saying that serving in our town council has been such an honor. Thank you. Uh, this is a great town, and our residents really love living here. Uh, these days, um, and at the door, as we've all talked about, I, I've met a lot of people who are just sick and tired of D.C. politics and the gridlock happening in Hartford, and I don't blame them. Uh, but here in West Hartford, we don't focus on the politics. We focus on what matters, a good quality of life for all of us. That's why we continue to rank as one of the best places to, places to live, and our schools are awarded national recognition. Because West Hartford is such an attractive place for businesses, our grand list has continued to grow. We've seen big changes at Corbin's Corner, new businesses on Park Road and, and Bishop's Corner, and the continued success of the center. This is smart growth that makes our town more walkable and bike friendly. We now have weekly recycling, increased solar power, and beekeeping. <laughs> if I were going to describe West Hartford to someone who has never been here, and I do that a lot, I would use words like diverse, vibrant, innovative, and compassionate. We as a town make intelligent and well thought out decisions, and that is the key to our success. I hope I will earn your vote to serve a second term on town council. 
I will continue to be a strong voice for environmental responsibility and diversity. I will protect our pocketbooks by making sure every dollar spent is appropriate and necessary, and that we pay down debt. Thank you for your consideration of my candidacy. I would appreciate your continued support for me, Ben Wenograd, and for the rest of the Democratic team on Election Day, November 7th. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Chris, we'll end with you with your closing statement. Okay. Thank you, Janet. Appreciate it. <clears throat> it has been an honor, truly, to serve my hometown as a member of the town council, um, and it's been great to do that you know, while my kids were young so they can really learn about community service. Um, but the reason I'm running for re-election is because I've always thought that West Hartford's greatest attribute has been that it's a place where all people of different backgrounds and socioeconomic levels can call home. And I believe that the economic trends of West Hartford that we've been talking about throughout this budget, the trajectory of its, excuse me, throughout this debate, its budget trajectory, I think, is making that uh, legacy of West Hartford um, at risk. It's putting it at risk. Since 2003, the Democrat Party has been in power. Over that period of time, our budget has increased $127 million, or 80%. The school budget has risen from $90 million to $160 million. At the same time, our town population has remained flat and our student population has declined and has continued to, uh, is projected to continue to, to decline over that same period of time. And tonight we heard a lot of things about why that may be. We heard about $22 million pension payment. We heard about non-payment in the 1990s. The Democrat Party has been in power for the last 14 years. They need to have a better justification than those two issues. They're nice people. I like them. I disagree with them. We need to have flatter budgets. We know it's possible. Surrounding towns do it. We need to deal with our collective bargaining units in a very realistic way because they have as much at stake as we do as well. Uh, I vow to continue to be an advocate for uh, people's uh, pocketbooks if reelected. Um, so thank you for your time tonight. Thank you, Janet. Appreciate thank you. it. Appreciate, appreciate all the candidates who were here tonight. Thank you for coming. I really appreciate the time you are devoting, not only to the debates, but also to running. That is, that's really, I know it takes a lot of time to do something like that. Mm -hmm. Thank you to our league timers for keeping us all on track, and to WHC-TV for airing this debate. Please note to everybody watching that this debate is going to be showing regularly through our election November 7th. Please let your know, friends know of this opportunity to view these debates and to see the candidates, both Town Council and Board of Education, discuss these important issues to West Hartford. Thank you for viewing.